Francoise, who had been for many years in my aunt's service and did not at that time suspect that she would one day be transferred entirely to ours, was a little inclined to desert my aunt during the months that we spent in her house. There had been in my infancy, before we went to Combray, and when my aunt Leonie used still to spend the winter in Paris with her mother, a time when I knew Francois so little that on New Year's Day, before going into my great aunt's house, my mother put a five franc piece in my hand and said, now be careful, don't make any mistake. Wait until you hear me say, good morning, Francoise, and I touch your arm before you give it to her. No sooner had we arrived in my aunt's dark hall than we saw in the gloom, beneath the frills of a snowy cap as stiff and fragile as if it had been made of spun sugar, the concentric waves of a smile of anticipatory gratitude. <coughs> it was Francoise, motionless and erect, framed in the small doorway of the corridor like the statue of a saint in its niche. When we had grown more accustomed to this religious darkness, we could discern in her features a disinterested love of all humanity, blended with a tender respect for the upper classes, which raised to the most honorable quarter of her heart the hope of receiving her New Year's gifts. Mama pinched my arm sharply and said in a loud voice, Good morning, Francoise. At this signal, my fingers parted and I let fall the coin, which found a receptacle in a confused but outstretched hand. But since we had begun to go to Combray, there was no one I knew better than Francoise. We were her favorites, and in the first years at least, while she showed the same consideration for us as for my aunt, she enjoyed with us a keener relish, because we had, in addition to our dignity as part of the family, for she had for those invisible bonds by which community of blood unites the members of a family as much respect as any Greek tra tragedian the fresh charm of not being her customary employers. And so with what joy she would welcome us, with what sorrow complain that the weather was still so bad for us on the day of our arrival, just before Easter, when there was often an icy wind. Well, Mama inquired after her daughter and her nephews, and if her grandson were nice, was nice, and what they were going to make of him, and whether he took after his grandmother. Later, when no one else was in the room, Mama, who knew that Francoise was still mourning for her parents, who had been dead for years, would speak of them kindly, asking her endless little questions about them and their lives. She had guessed that Francoise did not like her son-in-law and that he spoiled the pleasure she found in visiting her daughter, as the two could not talk so freely when he was there. And so one day when Francoise was going to their house, some miles from Combray, Mama said to her with a smile, Tell me, Francoise, if Julien has had to go away and you have Marguerite to yourself all day, you will be very sorry, but you will make the best of it, won't you? And Francoise answered, laughing, Madame knows everything. Madame is worse than the X-rays. She pronounced X with an affectation of difficulty and with a smile of self-deprecation. Her, an unlettered woman, daring to employ a scientific term. The X-rays they brought here from Madame Octave which see what is in your heart. And she went off, disturbed that anyone would be caring about her, perhaps anxious that she should not see her in tears. Mama was the first person who had given her the pleasure of feeling that her peasant existence, with its simple joys and sorrows, might offer some interest, might be a source of grief or pleasure to someone other than herself. My aunt resigned herself to doing without Francoise to some extent during our visits, knowing how much my mother appreciated the services of so active and intelligent a maid, one who looked at, as nice at five o'clock in the morning in her kitchen under a cap whose stiff and dazzling frills seemed to be made of porcelain as when dressed for high mass, who did everything well, who toiled like a horse, whether she was well or ill, but without noise, without the appearance of doing anything. The only one of my aunt's maids who, when Mama asked for hot water or black coffee, would bring them actually boiling. She was one of those servants who in a household seems least satisfactory at first to a stranger, doubtless because they take no pains to make a conquest of him and show him no special attention, knowing very well that they have no real need of him, that he will cease to be invited to the house sooner than they will be dismissed from it. Who, on the other hand, 
cling with most fidelity to those masters and mistresses who have tested and proved their real capacity. And do not look for that superficial responsiveness, that slavish affability, which may impress a stranger favorably, but often conceals an ineducable nonentity. When Francoise, having seen that my parents had everything they required, first went upstairs again to give my aunt her pepsin and to find out from her what she would take for lunch, it was very rare for her not to be called on to give an opinion or to furnish an explanation in regard to some important event. Just fancy, Francoise, Madame Goupil went by more than a quarter of an hour late to fetch her sister. If she loses any more time on the way, I would not be at all surprised if she, arised ap if she arrived after the elevation. Well, there would be nothing wonderful in that, would be the answer. Or, Francoise, if you had come in five minutes ago, you would have seen Madame Ambert go past with some asparagus, twice the size of what Mother, Mother Callot has. Do try and find out from her cook where she got them. You know, this spring you've been serving asparagus with everything. You might be able to get some like these for our visitors. I wouldn't be surprised if they came from the curés, Françoise would say. And, I'm sure you wouldn't, my poor Françoise, my aunt would reply, shrugging her shoulders. From the curés, indeed. You know quite well that he can never grow anything but wretched little twigs of asparagus, not asparagus at all. I tell you that these were as thick as my arm, not your arm, of course, but my poor arm, which has grown so much thinner again this year. Or, Francoise, didn't you hear that bell just now? It split my head. No, Madame Octave. Oh, poor girl. Your skull must be very thick. You may thank God for that. It was Magdalene come to fetch Dr. Pipro. He came out with her at once, and they went off along the Rue de l'Oiseau. There must be some child ill. Oh, dear, dear, the poor little creature would come with a sigh from Francoise, who could not hear of any calamity befalling a person unknown to her, even in some distant part of the world, without beginning to lament. Or, Francoise, for whom did they sound the death knell just now? Oh, dear, of course, it would be for Madame Rousseau. And to think that I had forgotten that she passed away the other night. Indeed, it is time the Lord called me home, too. I don't know what has become of my head since I lost my poor Octave, but I'm wasting your time, my good girl. Indeed, no, Madame Octave, my time is not so precious. Whoever made our time didn't sell it to us. I am just going to see that my fire hasn't gone out. <laughs>